you know, on a pretty regular basis around here, we talk about how everybody is dealing with something. You know, and sometimes we, we come in here, we, we bring our, our stuff in with us, and we, we sing songs like that with these just incredible promises from God's Word, just as a, a reminder. And, and if you're in the middle of going through it, I just, I, I pray that uh, that that song was just such an incredible uh, encouragement to you um, and a blessing to you as well. If you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18 today. You can open up to there. You can grab a Bible in the back if you, you don't have a Bible with you today. It's our gift to you. So, so Kelly's great-grandparents uh, owned a farm in Cambria County uh, back in the 1800s. And when the time came for the old homestead to be sold, uh, it's about the time that, that Kelly and I were getting married, and we were fortunate enough that they gifted us with this old Hoosier cabinet. And so we got it, and it was a mess covered in layers and layers of paint. And I, I was like, oh, I just, I, I want to restore this. And so I, I began the process of getting the, with the paint stripper and just layer after layer after layer uh, of p- removing this paint from this old Hoosier cabinet from the late 1800s. And, and in my garage, I'm just, it's just hours and hours and days and weeks of, of this. And, and, I, and I got it to a place where I'm re- now I'm ready to sand it. I'm sanding it down to its original red oak uh, wood, and it's just, it's, it looks beautiful. And I'm like, I don't want to paint this. I don't, I don't even want to stain this. I just I want to put on a couple of layers of polyurethane that's going to make this, this original wood you know, it's just pop to, to come out. And, and it, was, it was hard, hard work but it was worth it. And, and maybe you, you, you've restored something uh, at some point. Maybe it was a, 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 a car or some furniture, you, and, and you know that, 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 that feeling that this, this, this work of restoration, it's, it's hard work, but it's absolutely worth it. Maybe, maybe flipping a house, right? And, and there are just times that, that we understand that sometimes we, we, we restore things, but we also realize that there are times when we need to restore people. And, and there are times when, when people wander away from God, people who, who sin and, and, and choose to, to walk away from God, and, and they need to be restored. And, and the question becomes for all of us today that we're going to look at is, are we willing to do the hard work to restore someone back to God? So if you've got your Bibles open now, Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 20. There's two sections of Matthew 18 that we're going to look at today. I'm going to read both of them, and then we'll come back and talk about them. This is the Word of God. Jesus said, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier than that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. The next section, Jesus continues, if your brother or sister sins... Go and, point it out, go, out, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gathered in my name, there am I with them. And so in today's text, if you're reading in your own Bible, right, we're in this middle middle of this long discourse, this long teaching from Jesus to his disciples. And so we're in this section where where Jesus is talking about how it is that we as his disciples are to live in community, how we're to be the church. And so last week we talked about how Jesus said that the greatness in the kingdom of heaven is found in humility. And in today's passage, we're continuing to look at this teaching, and and his, his focus is shifting to the church's role when people find themselves 
wandering away from God for whatever reason. And what we're going to discover today, and what I hope that you'll walk away from today, is that God calls us to restore those who wander away. So let's dive in. If you've got your Bible still open, look at verse 10. Jesus said, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. So we talked about the little ones last week, if you remember. Right? Who are they? Right? They're, the, they're his disciples, his, his followers who, who are humbly following him, seeking to do his will. Right? And, and so Jesus, he, as he's teaching now, he knows a, a, a sad but, but true reality. Too often in today's culture, and I'm guessing in the first century as well, we, 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 the world, our culture, despises those who are humble. We look down upon them. We, we overlook them. We, we judge them for, for being last. We, we ignore their voices. We treat them as insignificant. We don't give them influence. What, what happens is those who are, who are the loudest, who are the most brash, right? they're the ones who, who seem to, to be elevated in today's culture, but not with Jesus. Jesus is very clear to us that we're not to despise, we're not supposed to look down upon those who are humble, or who maybe the world would say are, are insignificant. But when he looks at his church, right, when he looks at us as his church, right, he would say no member in God's family, no matter how weak, no matter how marginal, marginal is to be treated as an inferior. Right? And to, to drive that point home, Jesus makes this, this mind-blowing statement about angels. He doesn't talk about angels very often. And so like Jesus says, there, there's these, these angels in heaven that are representing these little ones, these people who are humble disciples of Jesus. To who? To, to God Almighty. I mean, think about that. The, the weakest member of our church has a direct line. Has, uh, these angels are, are speaking to God on that person's behalf. Right? And I, like I think about, there, we have a, a, a team of people, a group of people in our church who, who seek to care for those people in our, our congregation. So Cindy Johnzak, she she's, takes care of the congregational care at our church, and she has this team of people that go see people who are shut in, people who are in the hospital, people who, who are down and out, whatever it might be, and they, like, they, they love on these folks. People who may have been forgotten are not forgotten. People who are in need of care, they are cared for. And they're, they're serving and loving the, these little ones that Jesus is talking about in our church home. I'm so incredibly grateful for them. But the reality of life is, you know, some in the church, they, they, they wander away from the church. And so Jesus illustrates this by telling a parable. Look at verses 12 to 14 in your Bibles. Jesus continues, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hill and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. So if you, you've been a part of a church, you, you've probably heard this parable of, of the 91 and leaving the 91 and going in search of, of the one. And so Jesus tells it here in Matthew chapter 18, but he also tells it in Luke chapter 15. But, and I would, I would encourage you to read from Luke 15 because there's, there's a significant difference between the two accounts of this parable. So in Luke's gospel, Jesus talks about a sheep that is lost. Where here in Matthew chapter 18, it's a sheep that has wandered away. Right? And so it's, Jesus' point is that they're different, two different stories. He doesn't say the sheep in Matthew 18 is lost, right? He's, he's wandered off. And so what, why the distinction? What, what's, what's going on here? So, so the Greek word for, for wonder here, actually, it has the same root for the word deceive. So Jesus is describing someone that, that the church, maybe, maybe the church is overlooked or, or looked down upon, not cared for. And, and that person, for whatever reason, they, they, that reason, they, they've wandered away, right? And, and, that, and here's the thing, what I've noticed you read in scripture, and I, and I see it in the reality of people's lives in, in our church and other churches that I've served, is that, that Satan does his best work when he gets us alone. He, he loves to deceive us, to get us to the place where we're going to wander off and, and, and get, all, get us by ourselves, and that's where we're in a dangerous place. So Jesus, he, he's, here he's talking about somebody who is a believer, right? But he, this person is at risk for, for wandering away because, maybe because of church's failure to care for them. 
So he's not talking about non-Christians, not talking about the lost. He, he's talking about maybe ignored or, or overlooked Christians. And, and, and if you think about this, like, this is one of those things that, that's hard to talk about, even to admit, but, but we have to confront the truth here. I mean, it, it's, it's probably easier for us to, to, to ignore people who do wander away and say, hey, I mean, why bother with somebody, the one person, we've got 99 here, we can build a, a great ministry, we can build a great small group, we can build a great church, whatever, around the people who are still here who want to be here. Right? And that, that, one, that one sheep that has wandered off, ah, they don't matter. And Jesus is like, yes, they absolutely matter to him and they should matter to us. God calls us to restore those who wander away. And, and I don't know about you, but when I'm studying passages like this, it, like it breaks my heart to think, you know what, this, this is a reality in the church today. It, it makes me want to repent that like, sometimes it's, it's easier, it's tempting to, to focus on kind of the, the big programs, right? Re, instead of like, you know, thinking about the, the least and the last, the people who have wandered off. Right? It, it, we can talk about reaching the lost, but sometimes we, we make excuses for not reaching those who have wandered off. We make excuses, we'll say, hey, well, that's the pastor's job. That's why we pay the staff, right? That's my small group leader's job. Right? And, and, and like, no, right? what, we, what, we're, what we're called to do here by Jesus in Matthew chapter 18 is like, this is a call for ownership, to be the body of Christ, to be the church, right? to, to notice when someone hasn't been to worship, when someone hasn't been to our small group, someone who hasn't been on our serving team, they haven't showed up for a while, to pick up the phone and, and call them. Not to say, well, I hope somebody calls them. You're somebody. Reach out to them. Like, are, are we going to be known as, as a church that, that is known for, for letting these little ones that Jesus describes, letting them wander off? Or are we going to be a, a church that's known for, for restoring all people back to Jesus? Because I believe God calls us to restore those who wander away. And then Jesus got, he, he makes a little change here, the next section. What, what, what do we do whenever somebody wanders off because of their sin, right? In fact, I mean, you can even ask, what, 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 what do we do if, if someone, you know, whether they're a member of our church or another church, just a Christian, what do we do when some, somebody wanders away because of sin? What do we do then? Well, Jesus tells us, look at verses 15 to 17 in your Bibles. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. If they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, I want you to understand something. This is one of those things that's difficult for us to see in the English. But when Jesus is speaking here, he, all the language he's using is singular. It's not plural. Right? He's, he's not making this, this generalized statement to, to, to the whole church. Right? He's, he's saying every one of us as his disciples are to take ownership for this as individuals. And that, so th that means this isn't something that you can outsource or that I can outsource. Right? Can't say, hey, this is the pastor's job or this is the staff's job or it's my small group leader's job. This is the ministry area leader's job. No, no. He's saying, hey, if you follow me, this is your responsibility, yours as in singular, you. Right? He, he's talking to us as individuals. Will you listen to Jesus? And then, and then another note. This passage is, is often cited as the, as the biblical process for conflict resolution. And, and that certainly it absolutely applies. It's used this many, many times. But I think it's, it's bigger than that as well. And here's why. So if you have your Bibles open still, look at verse 15. Right? So in the NIV, which we, which we read here, right, it says, if your brother or sister sins, but if you're reading a, an older version of the NIV or perhaps another translation of the Bible, it says something different. Let me show you on the screen. So NIV at the top, if your brother or sister sins, right? but like the ESV, which I know a lot of people from our church read that, if your brother sins against you. right? And that changes things. And it's interesting, like, some ancient manuscripts don't have the part that's in yellow. It's just not there. 
And so for me, like when I read the NIV, I think, oh, they, I think that approach is better because it, it's saying, you know what, this is how we approach all situations. Not just if like Josiah and I have an issue with each other, right? Th- this, is, this is like anybody, right? right? This is restoring them, right? And, and it includes whenever it has, we have conflict resolution, but it can also be more than that. And so this is, this is a process that we should apply when, when somebody sins against a, another believer in the church or, or when sin causes conflict between two believers. And so this process works in all those situations. So, so let's w- just walk through these different steps of, of resolution. So first thing he says is, so when, when someone sins, we're supposed to post, put it all over social media, right? No. We're supposed to go to them privately. One-on-one. Look what he says in verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. <laughs> Let's be honest. This is the hardest step, right? Like you, you need to have incredible courage in order to do this, to, to, to do something like, oh, like we're not supposed to talk to other people about it. Like We're supposed to go one-on-one to the person, right? Point out their sin. Right? And, and, and we have to resist the temptation to form a relationship triangle. And, and what is a, a relational triangle? Well, it's any conversation, it's any relationship that has three people in it when it should only have two people in it. Right? And if I remember correctly, almost every conversation in middle school is a triangle. Right? Hey, Bob, Jenny told me to tell you that she's mad at you because of what you told Billy about her. Right? Like, let's not do that. Even if you're in middle school, let's not do that. Right? Let's, and, and so they, let's, let's not skip step one that Jesus is giving us. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And then, this is such a gift from Jesus. He gives us the why. He gives us the goal in this. Right? The goal is to win them back. Look, look at the second half of verse 15. It says, if they listen to you, you've won them over. Right? And so remember, like we are, we're dealing with someone whose sin has caused them to, to wander away or has caused a conflict. And so to win them over means that they're going to admit their sin, they're going to repent of it, and they're going to seek reconciliation and restoration. Right? What it doesn't mean is that you're trying to win an argument. You're not. You're not trying to win a competition. You're not trying to prove your superiority or how much information you know. You are trying to win a person. The person is the goal. Because God calls us to restore those who wander away. And then, if step one doesn't work, he goes to step two. Look at verse 16 in your Bibles. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So you've gone to the person, you've gone to them privately, right? And and it didn't work, right? And so now it's time to bring one or or two other people along, and and you want to talk to the person again, right? So when sin causes this conflict, right, I think oftentimes what we do is we we want to skip step one because it's hard, right? We, We don't like that kind of, you know, personal involvement in conflict, Right? And so we just we want to rush to step two. Like, let's get as many people involved as we possibly can. That's not what Jesus is saying. Right? Don't go to step two unless you can confidently say that you talked with the other person one-on-one, but they wouldn't listen to you. And so, so Jesus says that, that he kind of brings in some, some legal verbiage here. Right? That, that having more people come is required to establish a testimony. Right. So if someone refuses to, to listen to you privately, it, it's either because they, maybe they don't think that they sinned, may, maybe because they have a hard heart, or maybe you're the one that's in the wrong. Maybe you got it. You missed it. Right? And so this person, so, so whenever I walk through this process, right, so if I have a, an issue with Dave and, and it's not getting resolved, I'll go to Josiah, I'm like, hey, Josiah, I want you to come in as a second per, another person that's going, to be, that's going to help us. Like, I'm not asking Josiah to take my side or to take Dave's side. I'm asking him to take our side. Like, he's, he's for us, right? The, the second or third person, right, they're there to, to be for, for y'all, right, for yins, Right? 
to be to, the, per, the whole point, right? Remember, the whole goal is to restore the relationship. That's why the person's there, not to take sides. And so Jesus is pointing us back to Deuteronomy chapter 19, 15 to explain this step, which says, one witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses, right? And so we, we bring in this other one or two other people, right? And, and, and if it is indeed, we determine, yes, there was a sin, and this person's like, I don't care. I'm not repenting. I'm not sorry. Right, then, then we come to step three. Right, look at verse 17, the first part of 17. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And look, if we get to step three, this, this has become a pretty serious deal. Right, this, this, is, this, is, this is the last resort. Right, this, this means maybe a, a public statement in worship or, or to our congregation or, or maybe to our church council. And so if someone still refuses to acknowledge their sin, they still refuse to repent then they're clearly no longer in good standing with the church. And then Jesus says something that may have shocked us. Look at the second part of verse 17. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, on the surface, it, it may seem like that Jesus is saying, hey, you're going to shun somebody, right? Because they, they refuse to repent because they refuse to, to, to recognize their sin. But I, I want to remind you of something. Throughout the whole gospel of, of Matthew, who, who are the people that Jesus is seeking to reach? Pagans and tax collectors. And, and what is Matthew? Before he was a follower of Jesus, he was a tax collector. right? And so don't write a story in your head that Jesus isn't saying. Je, Jesus is saying that since the, the person is not willing to submit to the church, now we need to treat them as someone outside the church. And remember, our goal here, God calls us to restore those who wander away. And so the goal is, it's still restoration at this point, but now the strategy has changed. Instead of an insider who is, who is wandering, right, now they're an outsider who needs reached. The difference is profound. We treat them differently. And then Jesus, he, he wraps up this section of teaching with three powerful statements. Look at verses 18 to 20. Jesus says, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gathered in my name, there am I with them. And so when, when you read that, it's like, wait, and this just seems like, it's out of context. I don't know about you, but it, like in my Bible, there's, there's a variety of sections, right? And, and it's easy to kind of compartmentalize those sections and be like, oh, Jesus has moved on to a, to a new part. But no, it's still part of Matthew 18. It's still part of this teaching to his disciples. And so you're like, okay, then if it's still part of it, then, then what does this section of text have to do with restoring a, a wandering sinner? Well, realize that the, the process that Jesus has just outlined it's, it's never to be done lightly. Like calling out sin, confronting a sinner, and ultimately maybe if you have to, dismissing a sinner from, from a church. Like th Those are heavy, heavy topics. So Jesus, he's, he now he, he, he's made a change in his language. In the first section, he, I said it was all singular language. Now it's plural. Right Now he's speaking to the whole community. He's speaking to the church. And so to bind and to loose something, it means to declare what is right and what is wrong. So listen, Jesus is saying that the church has the authority to declare that something is a sin. And this, this, is, like, this is our responsibility to say this is right and this is wrong. This is a sin and this is holiness. Like that's what we're supposed to do in the church. And it's a huge responsibility. And Jesus right here, he's reminding the church that we have it. Now, this doesn't mean that the church has this carte blanche kind of thing where we're, we're just we're looking for every little thing and pointing everything out, every you know, speck in someone's eye before we take out the log in our own eye. No, that's not what he's saying. And, and I would even warn us. Like, when the church gets this wrong, when we abuse this, we're, we're going to have to answer to Jesus on Judgment Day. So we have to do this wisely and well. 
And Jesus says that, that if two disciples agree on anything they ask, it'll be done by God. And it's really easy to read this verse out of context and, and be like, oh man, something's going on in my life. I just got need to, and like, I just need to get like two or three people together. And as long as we say the same thing, God's got to do it, right? That's not the context here, right? Wait, wait. Jesus is talking about this, this enormous responsibility of church discipline. Jesus is talking about the, the prayer that the way we should pray as a church anytime that, that we're going through this process of, of restoring someone if you're in step one or you're in step two or in step three. Like prayer has got to be rooted in all of that. Right? And it should be a wake-up call to us. Right? There, there's, there's going to be times when, when you know you want to, you need to say something because someone has sinned against you and, and you have to, like, you need to talk to them and, and you can't talk to anybody else because it's just one-on-one. Who can you talk to then? talk to God. You can ask him for wisdom and discernment and courage. And so when you're doing this, are, are you praying? Or are you just jumping into him and be like, I got to talk to this person? Your attitude is everything. And then the last section, Jesus makes this incredible statement that he is present with us when, when two or three gather in his name. And again, this, this is the, remember the context of this. Right? I've, I've heard many, many people quote this. So I'd say, oh, you know, half of our small group didn't show up because it's summertime. And, well, Jesus said we're two or three are gathered together and he's with us. Well, he is with us. That's not what he's talking about here. Right? And, and he's, he's assuring us that as we're walking through these difficult conversations, these difficult you know, things that when we're dealing with sin, right, he's there. He's with us. Right? And so when, when we gather to, to figure out what this looks like and how to walk through this wisely and well in a way to, order, or to, to honor God and, and to restore this person, right? he's there right in the middle of all of that when we're praying. It's this wonderful blessing and reminder that we are not alone. Because remember, God calls us to restore those who wander away. You know, this is... This, we read some of these teachings from Jesus, and we're like, man, this is, this is hard stuff. This is such a difficult topic. But I, I want to begin with the, with the same question, or I want to end with the same question I began with. Are you and I? Like, are we willing to do the hard work of restoring someone back to God? I want you to think about someone. Maybe, maybe to think about someone who, who needs to be restored. Maybe someone who's left our church or another, left another church, who's walk, maybe walked away from a relationship with you. Who, who do you know that's wandered away? Do you have their picture in your mind, their name? What are you going to do? Are you going to reach out to them? Or let them go? Because I believe that Jesus is saying, it, it's, we're the church. It's our responsibility to reach out to them and to, to, to lead them back to restoration. And, it, and it's, it's, it's challenging. It's, it takes courage. It takes an insane amount of prayer before we even have those conversations. It takes humility to do it. I think it takes spiritual maturity. And it takes holiness. It's hard work. But it's worth it. See, I believe that God has not forgotten those who've wandered away. Let's not forget them either. Let's pray. Gracious Holy Father, we thank you for your word. And even when we get into texts like this that really challenge us and, and, and stretch us out of our comfort zone, God, I think every one of us can probably think of someone who, who has wandered away from the church, someone who has, has hurt us, who has sinned against us. And, and we have not done the, the good hard work of, of going to them and seeking to restore that broken relationship. God, would you forgive us? We know every one of those people mattered to you. We know that Jesus died on the cross for every one of them. We, we know that you raised Jesus from the dead for them. God, would you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, give us courage. 
God, would you, you give us a, such an incredible love for those who may have wandered away or may have hurt us or sinned against us. That we would do this good, hard work that, that Jesus teaches about in, in our church and in our lives. God, that one matters. That one matters to you. And I pray that one would matter to us. Father, we love you and we praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.